I want to greet you again in the precious name of Jesus. We're glad to be here again this evening. We had a, I hope you all had a good, as good of a day as my wife and I did. I think the boys had a good day too. I think they did some fishing, but we found out the fishing in Montana is not as good as it is in Idaho. <laughs> what they say, they spent $35 on a fishing license and had $500 worth of fun. So it must have been worth it. It was a good deal. <clears throat> I appreciate those, those comments, Brother Tom, on taking in the living water and then letting it flow out. I had to think of the, the Dead Sea. You know, that the Dead Sea, the water flows in and it has no outlet. And it's called the Dead Sea. Is it any wonder? So if the, if the water flows in here tonight and doesn't flow out, then we've missed our calling, I guess. <clears throat> you all live in a quiet place. I, I, we've really been impressed with how quiet it is here. Um, the little cabin there at Marty's along the river there, it's just, it's very peaceful. And then we walk down the road and we don't hear any car noise, there's no sawmill. It's probably more noisy here closer to town, but where we live, there's, we can hear a sawmill, we can hear highway noise, and it seems like there's always a racket going on. So I was just impressed with, it, with how quiet it is here and, and peaceful. And going along with the message tonight, um, I want to look at God's faithfulness through the Holy Spirit or God's gift of the Holy Spirit. And for us to hear the Holy Spirit, we need to be quiet. We need to be quiet and listen, have our hearts open to him. <clears throat> so I'd like to read from John chapter 16. verse 7 to 13, and this is just before Jesus' death and resurrection, and he's telling his disciples that he's going to leave them, but he's not going to leave them alone. He's not going to leave them and, and just be gone. He said he's going to send a comforter to be with them. John chapter 16, starting at verse 7, says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father. And ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the Prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Albeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. We have a, we have a tremendous gift here in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, I've often thought of it when Jesus was here, when he was walking this earth with his disciples, how wonderful that would have been. You know, they could interact with him, they could talk to him, they could ask him questions, things would come up. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there was lots of times that we don't have recorded where Jesus sat and just talked with his disciples and shared with them. Yeah, we look at that and say that would be the ultimate. And we're looking forward to that time that we can do that, where we can sit with Jesus and just talk and discuss things and how is, how is this and how is that. But we do have the Holy Spirit here today. He lives in our hearts and he shows us. He guides us, he brings us comfort, and he shows us the truth. <clears throat> I don't know how it was back in the Old Testament when, when those people didn't have the Holy Spirit. Um, there's different times where it mentions the Spirit of God came on them. So it, it was different than what we have today. Today we have the Holy Spirit living in our hearts. And that's, yeah, that's just such a wonderful, a wonderful gift. <clears throat> 
So what do we do when the Holy Spirit shows us something? Um, I really like how the people responded in Acts chapter 2 when Peter was there preaching to them. And he was preaching to, from the way I understand it, he was preaching to the people that crucified Jesus. Um, in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, it says, Now when they, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were pricked in their heart, and so they asked the question, What shall we do? Um, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, when he speaks to me, am I defensive or do I say, what do I do? Hopefully I can, I can say, what do I do? <clears throat> then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So there it is. Repent and be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. God is calling us today, right here in Thompson Falls, Montana. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's, that goes on all the way, I believe, to the end of time. And I know this is not maybe necessarily comforting when the Holy Spirit pricks our hearts. Um, I've been pricked many times physically with a pin. It hurts. I remember sitting in church sometimes and, and I wasn't as wakeful as I should be and got this little prick, usually from my brothers, um, to keep you awake. It doesn't feel very good, but it, it, it gets your attention and I believe that's what was happening here. You know, the, the Holy Ghost is not, he's, a, he's very much of a gentleman. Um, I've had to think of that so many times. When, when we hear something, when we're pricked in our hearts, um, the Holy Spirit doesn't hit us over the head with a two-by-four or stop us like just in our tracks. He very gently speaks. And I believe that's God allowing us the choice. You know, he doesn't force us into doing anything. Just this gentle, quiet call. The Holy Spirit is very much of a gentleman. <clears throat> and so when we hear that, that gentle call, uh, when we're prompted, when the Holy Spirit prompts us, um, and I'm talking to myself here tonight. I've, I've been talking to myself every night here. Um, when the Holy Spirit prompts us to do something, let's listen. I had to think of this a couple of months ago. I was... I was had a, I was having a rough day. That's pretty mildly, mild way to put it. But I had to go do something and I did not want to do it. Um, and so, but I decided, yes, I'm gonna do this. And so I went and did it. And I was, I was, I had just gotten out of my vehicle and I was going into this building and I was dreading it pretty bad. And my phone, jingled like it does when, when one of the men, we have this WhatsApp group for our men in church, and it made the little jingle, and I opened it up and looked at it. And don't you know, one of my dear brothers from the church there, he just, I say randomly, no, I don't think it was random, not at all, sent out this message, and here's what it said, just a little motto thing, it says, Courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the little voice at the end of the day that says, I'll try again tomorrow. I needed that right then. I needed that so bad. And you know, Chad had no idea what I was going through that day. He didn't have a clue. And yet I believe the Holy Spirit, when, when, when Chad saw that, he said to himself, I'm gonna put that on the men's group. I believe that was from the Holy Spirit. And if he wouldn't have done that, there would have been a, a big blessing missed on my part and on, on his part. I sent, I sent him a, a message back. I said, Chad, I could just hug you. And he just put a little smiley face. <laughs> God bless him. 
Let's do that for each other. Let's just be that little voice out there sending encouragement when the Holy Spirit prompts us to. It is so incredibly encouraging. You sisters can do that too. Um, I'm sure you do. Be an encouragement to each other when the Holy Spirit prompts us to. <clears throat> I think I mentioned uh, Paul's conversion last night a little bit, but I would like to actually read Acts chapter 9 tonight. You know, we've seen, we've seen people's lives change drastically. Um, when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them, when, when they experience Jesus in their life and they make that 180 degree turn, it is so wonderful to see that. And then the Holy Spirit works and, and just continues to, to keep that process going. And uh, Paul is a really, really good example of that. <clears throat> and it starts out here, um, well, I'll just start in verse 1. It says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he, if he found any in this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Can you picture Saul here? He is muttering and sputtering, and he's fuming out threatenings and these, these nasty little, I can just hear him, muttering about these Christians. Ah, oh, Christians. And he's going to get rid of them. On his way, I mean, he is on a mission. He's, he is serious about it. Look what happens. Verse 3, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Paul was, Paul was immediately open to the call of Jesus on his life. What wilt thou have me to do? The Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. <clears throat> this really upset Paul's, or Saul, he's still called Saul here. It upset his life. For three days he was, he was blind and he didn't eat or drink. So he was taking this pretty serious. Verse 10, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, behold, I am here, Lord. Notice how these people respond. Behold, I am here, Lord. I find that interesting. Am I willing to respond that way when the Lord calls? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen a vision, a man named Ananias, coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done by the saints, to, the, to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and, and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. When he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then Saul was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Wow, what an experience. 
Um, <clears throat> it's interesting, though, to me that when, when, when Ananias received this vision, he was told to go, go talk to this Saul from Tarsus. He knew immediately who that was. He'd heard of him. He was, he was probably terrified because this was, I mean, this, he was gathering up Christians and taking them in and, and persecuting them. And uh, that's the first indication that we had that Ananias was like, oh, wait a minute, God, I'm not sh so sure I want to do this. But when the Lord said, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, then Ananias went. He didn't wait, he went. He was willing to do it. <clears throat> he was willing to be obedient. <clears throat> You know, it's a good thing we can't see into the future and see all the things that are going to happen. I know it would be nice sometimes to be able to, to know if we do this and this, then what's going to happen in the future. Um, we, can, we, we can know that if, if the Holy Spirit nudges us to do something, then it's safe. It's okay to do it. Um, <clears throat> But I had to think of this story of my sister that it was something that she did way back here that caused an effect way years later in her life. And that's how it is with, with doing what the Holy Spirit calls us to do. We don't know what God is working on. You know, he's got a, he's got a plan maybe years down the road that we don't see. Sometimes we can see it, but often we don't see the results of, our, of what he's calling us to do. So my sister, we lived there in Seymour, Missouri, and she was about 18 or 19 years old. And her and one of her friends went over to Summersville, Missouri. It was about, I think, two hours away. And they were babysitting for this family. The parents were going to leave somewhere. I'm not sure what they were doing. Anyway, they, they had asked them to come over and take care of the children while they were gone. So my sister and her friend went over there and <clears throat> spent the night. Well, sometime during the night, middle of the night, the house caught on fire. And they woke up and the house was full of smoke, there was flames, it was terrifying. So my sister and, and her friend quickly got the children that they could and they broke one of the windows, they gashed their arms, they had pretty big cuts, and they pulled these children out through the window as fast as they could, and they got out. All except the one boy, he was, he was at the other end of the house, they found him later, right on the inside of the door, and he had, he had passed away. It was really, really sad, but they saved, uh, I don't know how many it was, five or six of the other children, the rest of them. <clears throat> couple of girls and maybe one boy. Well, the oldest girl's name was Sharon. And so at the time my, my sister was dating, she went on to get married, had a family, moved to Idaho, and their youngest daughter's name was Mildred. So life went on. This Sharon that she had pulled out of the, out of the burning house Grew up, got married, had a family, and moved to Alaska. And over the course of time, this, my niece, my sister's daughter, and this Sharon, their son, decided, not knowing each other at all, but at the same time decided to go to Hillcrest to work at the old, old people's home. So they met there. And it wasn't long, and an, an interest grew. They were, they noticed each other. The young man noticed my niece, Mildred. And so they started dating. And last summer, I think it was, they got married. So what would have happened, or, or don't you see the effect? My sister pulling this young girl out of the house, not knowing that one day her daughter would marry this young girl's son. It's amazing how God works. We don't know, we don't know what the Holy Spirit is doing 
often when he tells us to do something. All we need to do is obey. And the blessing that that can bring years down the road, we don't see that. But God does, and he knows exactly what he's doing. We can be thankful for that. <clears throat> There's a verse in uh, Jude, actually two verses, 20 and 23, says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for mercy, for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So I guess there's a little bit of a spiritual connection here with, you know, my sister pulled them, those children out of the fire. That was a physical thing. But for us, as we're going throughout our day and are on the job, wherever we are, witnessing for the Lord, we can be pulling people out of the fire. There's people out there that, that are Sad to say, they are headed for hell. And if we're not witnessing to them, if we don't, when the Holy Spirit prompts us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them, we're basically leaving them in the burning house when we could so easily be reaching in there and pulling them out of that, that burning house. It's, it's really, a, I know... I struggle with that sometimes. It's so easy to just be quiet. Um, we try to, we say that we live, we live by example. Yeah, they can see our life. They can see um, what we believe by our life and, and our work ethic and all that. But there is a time to speak. Solomon says there's a time to speak. And uh, we need to speak up when we have our chances to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> So, listen when the Spirit prompts. Or speak up when the Spirit prompts us to. Um, in church, Sunday school, whenever. I would throw out just a word of caution here on, on uh, the Holy Spirit. And, you know, there's... Sometimes there's, and we don't want to judge, but there are people that get carried away with this Holy Spirit movement and maybe make it more than it really is or, or it's from their own self, this making it appear like it's the Holy Spirit. We need to make sure that the work of the Holy Spirit is genuine in our lives and, and it's not just our own made-up thing. <clears throat> You know, at the day of Pentecost, when, when all the Christians were there together, um, it says there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. So, in Scripture, the Holy Spirit is often manifests himself, or fire is a type of the Holy Spirit. It's often called the Holy Ghost in Scripture. <clears throat> so... I ran across this interesting account a number of years ago, but way back in Leviticus chapter 9, and I'm just going to read two verses there. There was a Leviticus chapter 9, verses 23 to 24. So it starts out by saying that Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people, and there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. So they put this offering on the, on the altar, and they prayed, and then the fire came down and burnt it up. And, and I would see that as a... Um, manifestation of the Holy Spirit of God's presence doing what what it was supposed to do but then look what happens in the in the next two verses there in chapter 10 it says and Nadab and Abihu the sons of Aaron took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon 
and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. That is pretty serious. They were putting strange fire or making up their own fire, like, like we, do, we can do, making up what looks like the Holy Spirit, and it isn't. Very dangerous thing to do. We don't want to do that. <clears throat> so it's just a word of caution there on, on that. We want to make sure that the Holy, it, it really is the Holy Spirit working in our lives, and it's very easy to do. Um, the, the Bible says to test the spirits. And if it's anything against what the Bible says, it's, it's very, it makes itself very obvious. If it goes against anything in the Bible, then it's not the Spirit of God. <clears throat> so there's, as in anything, there's, there's a ditch on each side of the road. We can either be making, making up our own Holy Spirit or making it appear like we have the Holy Spirit when we don't, or the other side of the ditch, we can be suppressing the Spirit. We don't want to do that either. And probably, as Anabaptists, as Mennonite people, that's probably more the, the ditch that we might tend to fall into. Quenching the Spirit. First, First Thessalonians says, quench not the Spirit. We don't want to, we don't want to suppress him. We want to, we want to allow him to have free reign in our lives. <clears throat> So the last point I'd like to make here is to never underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit. He is very, very powerful. Um, there's many times where, and I'm, I'm sure you've experienced it here too, where the, the devotions and the message are very near, related to each other closely. Well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. It can be from a brother... Mike lives way down in Plains, and Mark maybe way up on the other side of Thompson Falls, and they come together Sunday morning, and they're, they might have the same subject to talk about. It doesn't happen every time. It doesn't need to, but sometimes it does, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He's working in your hearts and in your lives, and uh, it's just really comforting when that happens. <clears throat> so never underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit in prayer. Very, very powerful, the work of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to share with you here a little story. It, this, this happened down in Georgia. There, there was a church. There is a church down there. Um, it's an Anabaptist church, maybe a little bit different than we are, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but there's a youth group there. And so one night, the youth girls all got together. They wanted to meet and get together and pray. They had a burden, and I believe the Holy Spirit laid this burden on their heart. They had a burden for two of the young boys that were in the youth group. So they got together one evening and they, they wanted to pray for these two boys. They, they had taken their own way. They were, they were going down a path that was not good. It was not, it was not gonna lead them to heaven, just bluntly speaking. And so they got together there in some, one of the girls' house, and they wanted to pray. And before they started, one of the girls was like, you know, I need, I've got something here I want to confess first. And so whatever it was, she cleared her heart of that. And uh, when she was done, one of the other girls came up with something she wanted to share too. And, and they went on and they shared for a couple of hours. In fact, it was midnight until they, they felt like they were ready to pray. And so they knelt down there and they prayed for these two boys. When they were done praying, they got up and they went home. <clears throat> By five o'clock the next morning, both of those boys went to two different ministers on either end of town and was knocking on the door. They wanted in. They wanted to make things right with God. Isn't that amazing? the power of the Holy Spirit. He could reach out and gently call those boys, call them to themselves. Very simple thing. Those girls just got together. They were being obedient to what God called them to do. Where would those boys be tonight if those girls hadn't been faithful, hadn't listened 
to that Holy Spirit calling in their life. Very, very, very powerful. We had that Holy Spirit here with us tonight, and he wants to work in our hearts. Praise God. Let's just open up our hearts to him. Allow him to work whatever he wants to do in our lives. I just, I just really thank God for that. <clears throat> I'd like to close by reading John 14, verses 16 and 17. It says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Praise the Lord. And I'm sure he's, he's in your hearts here tonight. And... Uh, Keep listening to that still, small voice and being obedient to him. Why don't we stand for a closing prayer? <clears throat> Our dear Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you this evening for your Holy Spirit that you give us. He gently calls, he leads, he guides, he comforts. Many, many have, have gone through very deep sorrow and grief, and your Holy Spirit is there to comfort us. We thank you for that, dear God. And so I just pray tonight, Lord, that each one here can, each one of us can be still and quiet and listen for that, for that quiet voice of the Holy Spirit and be open to him. Just open ourselves completely and allow you to work in our hearts. And uh, we just thank you for that. So just go with us here. Be with us as we go home. Keep us safe on the roads. And may you bring us safely back together again tomorrow for a, a, a day of rest, a day of worship, a day of glorifying you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. <clears throat>